Number 10, Bonnie and Clyde. They kind of wrote the book on couples doing bad things. Where if a bad couple happens to make headlines, they could be described as a real Bonnie and Clyde, a modern Bonnie and Clyde. Bonnie Parker and Clyde Barrow were as thick as thieves, two peas in a pod. Merciless crooks that formed a gang in the early 1930s and wreaked havoc across middle America by robbing banks and exercising their second amendment a little too liberally. They were becoming a real thorn in the side for law enforcement. To make matters worse, they're becoming somewhat idolized for their crimes by some of the public. Not good. However, not even a Ford V8 could help them outrun the law for too long, as one day in 1934, it saw the young couple ambushed by agents. And by agents, I mean they turned the car and the crooks into Swiss cheese. A lot of blam blam going on, you know what I'm saying? It wasn't good. Number 9, Paul Bernardo and Carla Homolka. Despite Canada being a majestic land, and full of moose, mounties, and rivers of maple syrup and politeness. It's not all fine and dandy up here, folks. Mm -mm, nope. We have our fair share of whack jobs, too. Take, for example, Paul Bernardo and Carla Homolka, a Canadian couple who in the early 90s took part in some heinous crimes, including the delifing of Carla's own sister. Ooh, and maybe even some sexual related crime. It was Nazi, it was bad. When it came down to the trial, Paul was going away for a very long time. Nothing was going to change that. However, Carla got the plea deal of a lifetime and got a fraction of the time compared to Paul. However, videotapes found after the case show that Carla was much more involved than previously thought and would have given her a sentence much closer to Bernardo, maybe even the same. She's currently a free woman. Gross. Number eight, Charles Manson. Okay, this one isn't so much a couple as it is like a thruple or like a grouple. Lots of people in her twin. Anyway, uh, just a weird group of hippies. But Charles Manson was involved, romantically speaking, with uh, his family members or cult or uh, whatever you want to call it, rather. You can't get much more scandalous than Manson. The Manson family took refuge at Spawn Ranch, an abandoned ranch that had been used as a film lot in the past, located in sunny California, Los Angeles. The family often experimented with mind-altering substances, uh, the same ones that made the Beatles the Beatles. Unfortunately, it wasn't all fun-loving and vegan commune happiness brother at Spawn Ranch as the family became involved in numerous criminal activities, which eventually involved in the delifing of an up-and-coming movie star, Sharon Tate. You ask your mom and dad about her, She'll, they'll tell you, they'll remember. If you've ever seen Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, then you'd also understand. I try to relate things, make it more relatable for you, but ask your mom and dad, they'll tell you about the 60s. Number seven, Susan and James Carson. Susan and James both had some troubled backgrounds. Can't have a criminal with that one, really. They fell in love and, well, they fell in love with the same illicit substance that made the Rolling Stones, uh, the Rolling Stones. They changed their last name to Bear and well, it just gets worse after this point. God had written letters to them to do so. Eventually, they declared themselves witch hunters and began a spree of violent crimes. Because that's just, you, that's what you do. The bodies in the evidence kept piling up and they kept disappearing. A manifesto was eventually found calling for the assassination of then president Ronald Reagan and late night comedy legend Johnny Carson. No relation. They were sentenced to life and remained suspects in a bunch of unsolved cases. Ooh, I don't like that. That's gross. Number six, the Rosenbergs. 1950s America. What a beautiful place. Imagine if you will, you have a suburb with green grass, white picket fences, and a starter home. Dad buries his PTSD from the war and takes out his anger on the family sometimes, even violently. Mom is a stay-at-home mom who's on so many prescriptions she's forced to lay down during the day with a vodka martini just to get her strength back from a headache. Oof. All while under the threat of atomic annihilation. Oh, America the brave, America the beautiful. Except the biggest thing every American feared back then was actually communist. Yeah, I know, right? Who would have thought? Communists coming to take over because they threatened the great American way of life. Julius and Ethel Rosenberg looked just like any other couple you'd find in the suburbs, except they were Soviet spies. Spies that aided a group that was leaking atomic secrets to the Soviets, allowing the Soviets to have a nuclear program years before the Americans suspected them of having one. Both de-life by the state after being found guilty. However, Ethel wasn't as guilty as previously thought and could have received a lighter sentence. Oops. <laughs> Our bad. Oh, she's innocent? You know what I mean? The can flip the switch. Oh, dude, I already flipped the switch, dude. Too late. Number five, Amber Heard and Johnny Depp. Does this really need an introduction? That's all anybody's talking about right now. But Johnny Depp, one of America's greatest actors and teenage heartthrob on 21 Jump Street. Am I right, ladies? God, he was cute in that. Amber Heard uh, being some lady who had a breakout role as a fish lady in Aquaman. 
I haven't seen Aquaman, that's just what it looks like to me. And all of this in one of the messiest divorces ever publicized. Yikes. This trial is happening as I speak. Probably right now, it's happening right now. And we are slowly reaching the outcome. However, all I'll say is when two gorgeous millionaires marry each other and you mix in some illicit substances, well, are, are we really surprised this didn't work out? Johnny Depp we're talking about here. If I ever get rich and famous, I will never treat my loved ones like that or any of the amazing people that follow me. I love you guys. You're the best. Thanks so much for watching all the time, guys. I love you. And checking me out on my own socials. Oh, shucks. You guys are the best. Number four, French royalty. Imagine being so down bad with your husband that it starts a revolution and then inspires other European nations to be free from monarchical tyranny. Marie Antoinette and King Louis XVI were the last kings and queens of France. If crimes against humanity don't count, then I, I don't know what does. People had no rights, even less rights than truckers in Ottawa. Oh, that's the worst. It was a very interesting time in history. By the end, the Castile had been sieged, heads were on pikes, and the National Razor was brought out just to show how democratic a new government can be. Next time, be sure to share food at the bread table. That's all I gotta say about that. Number three, Cleopatra and Mark Antony. Talk about scandal. Oh, if we had social media back then, this would have been everywhere. A regular Romeo and Juliet. And a little bit of Bonnie and Clyde too, actually. Cleopatra had a few Roman men wrapped around her finger. It was politics, and she was playing the long game. The Starvex lovers were playing with two empires, some of the largest at the time. However, their political string pulling and bedsheet wrestling would come to a tragic end. Cleopatra and Mark Anthony would never be around to see their empires fall after some betrayal, and both of them having their lives taken away. They did, they did some naughty things in between that, though. They weren't there in ours. Number two, mustache man and blonde lady. Hey. Even the biggest, baddest guys in history get lonely. Ava Braun, mustache man's main squeeze and wife right up until the Red Army came a knocking. Oh boy, they came a knocking. We all know what he's guilty of and Honestly, I think she's kind of guilty too. We've all seen the lost German footage of the boys making plans at the eagle's nest, and there she is. I'd say that doesn't look too good. I'm not a lawyer, or I am, but it doesn't look too good. It's kind of like if Adam and I were on an episode of Cops, and we got pulled over in a car together. The footage made it to the show, which means there's something in the car. It all depends on who wants to take the blame. Otherwise, you're guilty by association, or an accessory to the fact. So, yeah, I think she is kind of guilty too. Mm -hmm. Yep. If you weren't guilty, you would've gone out in the bunker with her. You know what I'm saying, Chris? You know what I'm saying? Eh. Number one, Mussolini and partners, because he had more than one. A lot of people think Mustache Man did it on his own, but the truth is he had a lot of help from his fascismo friend in Italy, Mussolini. From organizing his fascist beatdown gangs with the brown shirts and all the war crimes in between, Mussolini had a hand in it. He showed him, showed him the way. Mussolini not only did all this while married, but kept the company of unsavory mistresses. It's a good thing he controlled the media because people wanted to say some bad things about him and his most favorite mistress, Claretta. His wife Rachel stayed with him up until the end when him and Claretta were brutally unalive by citizens fed up with his chin, he had a chin thing, and his fascismo government. Multiple crimes against humanity and cheated on his wife. You know, we, we know you knew better. Come on, let's be honest. Number 10, Tar and Feather. This is something Something my mom always said to me when I was being too loud, boisterous, or distracting her from a task at hand. I'm sorry mom, it's just what I do. Mind you, looking back, perhaps it wasn't my fault. Perhaps letting a hyper child eat chicken mac nuggets and soda after watching a bunch of 007 movies was not the right choice, mother. Hmm. I used to be a big 007 fan. After running all over my house, my mom would say, son, if you don't settle down, I'm going to tar and feather you. Well, in the times of Vikings, this was a legit punishment and for legit criminals. The crook's head would be shaven and covered in tar, which even that alone sounds horrible. And then a poof, I guess you describe it, of duck feathers was thrown onto his stickiness. He then would have to run through a gauntlet and everyone would be tossing stones and bricks because, well, I guess tar and feathers weren't enough. If you made it out alive, then no further punishment was required. Number nine, fines. Surprisingly enough, one of the most common punishments of the Viking era was fines. Nothing deters criminals like owing the governing body some cold hard cash. Except a lot of criminals don't really have any money, hence why they would steal in the first place, so owing money isn't exactly a great deterrent in my opinion. However, fines varied on the severity of the crime and who the person was or what the person was, and the law of the land, really. Viking civilizations didn't exactly have a written law and would differ from different lands. All I know is that in Skyrim, which is loosely based on that of Scandinavian folklore and Norse mythology, 
that when I get fined for committing a crime that I only did because I pushed the wrong button, I promise it was an accident, I immediately pay the fine and pickpocket it back. It's not so bad. You pay a fine, you get away. It's not, it's not so bad. Number eight, banishment. Hey, look over there, it's Scorgamore, said Ulfric, or someone of another Norse-like name like that. Don't worry, Norse sounds confusing to me too. What's not confusing, however, and very straightforward, but still pretty harsh, is banishment. If someone was found guilty enough of a crime, they could be banished from the village. And in time of wild beast disease and, well, other Vikings eyeing your village the same way flies look at cow manure, it was dangerous to be alone for that extended period of time. So some people were forbidden to come back into town and don the name Skorgenmore. Grr. We'll go with that. Good luck in the winter. That's all I have to say. That's a tough life. Number seven, outlawed. This one is kind of interesting. So oftentimes when choosing the punishment for a criminal, it came down to fines, banishment, and outlawing. And a lot of times, all three. Outlawing went hand in hand with banishment. In a nutshell, it means you are no longer protected upon the laws of the land. So should someone maybe want a little revenge, there's not much you can do. Should have committed that crime there, cowboy. Like I said before, this was oftentimes done to those who were banished, so not only were they tossed out of the village, but also not protected by the village anymore. Pretty much leaving the criminal to nature and whatever she has to offer. And we all know Mother Nature, she can be a little, uh, a little rough sometimes. Whew. Number six, rodeo. If you're gonna be dumb, you gotta be tough. This world is rough, if a man's gonna make it, he's gotta be tough. Wise words from a trailer park supervisor. Huh? This one is just crazy, stupid, and violent, so strap in, folks. There was a trial, or a way of passage, if you want to call it that, that involved grease, a cow, and a criminal. You take the angriest cow in your herd, and you grease its tail up like a fat dude whose thighs have been chafing all day at a water park. The crook's hands would also be greased up. The cow was given a not-too-pita-friendly poke from a farm tool, and the idea was while the cow was rightfully mad, kicking, stomping, and, uh, Mooing, the crook would have to hang on for as long as possible. If he did and didn't let go, then there was no charges. If he did fall off and slip and let go, then, uh, well, <laughs> so long von Schlurgenbergen for an Orl Ulfric. That's a Swedish name or something, I think. I don't know. Number five, Meat Hook. Sometimes when given fines, it wasn't always cash value that was taken. Sometimes if the crime was heinous enough, the evildoer's property and items were taken instead. Well, sometimes folks didn't like having their stuff taken, which makes sense, they put up a fuss. No one likes their stuff getting taken. Just ask George Carlin, he knows a lot about that stuff. Everybody loves their stuff. In order for authorities to take possessions from the convicted, they would slice their ankles open, which just talking about that makes me sick. And then for good measure, tie them up and suspend them from the ceiling from a beam in their house. No, not unaliving them, keeping them very alive, just severely hindering their movement and ability to say, hey, get your hands off my limited edition Obi-Wan Kenobi Lego set. That one's mine. Number four, tree hugger. I hope you folks at home aren't eating during this video. It's about to get a little mortal combat in here, if you will. Even though I watch videos when I eat. Carpet cleaning videos, anyone? Where's my lunch, you know what I mean? I, I, I love, I, I do weird things like that, I don't know. The second most horrible sentence the Vikings could bestow upon their criminals and dredges of their society involved a tree. I'll get to the first one later, it's pretty heinous. It involved a tree, a knife, and a squishy rope. Squishy rope, what? Yeah, I'll get to that. Trees being great symbols of Norse mythology and culture, it made sense to do this here. Shout out to Yggdrasil, oh, cool stuff. You take your perpetrator and you carve open his belly like a high school jack-o'-lantern contest, and you pull his intestines out, and you keep pulling them out till you've got enough to wrap around the tree. And you basically tie him there. Except you don't wrap him around the tree, he walks himself around the tree until he's out of string, like a sick yo-yo. Oh, gross. This was extremely painful, and not quick at all, as humans can live for a couple hours without their squishy rope inside their belly. Not to mention it probably attracted wild animals for a quick and easy meal. Not a good way to go. Don't recommend that, that's sick. That's twisted. Number three, drowning. Given the naval status of the Scandinavian nations at the time, it makes sense that they use water. It's simple, it's cheap, effective, and there's a lot of it. When a serious enough crime was committed, sometimes people were drowned, or in later terms, they ran out of oxygen underwater, tried to breathe underwater, overpowered by the tide, or was left unattended by the city swimming pool, if you catch my drift. Number two, trial by fire. There's water and there's fire, of course. 
Well, if cold water was too much for you, then this should warm you up. Trial by fire was more of a punishment uh, and less of a lethal one, if you will. If you survived the ordeal, that meant God was on your side. Thus, they couldn't be guilty because. Yeah, that, that totally works. The trial by fire included a couple different heat based trials. No amount of red potion or Goron's tunic would get you through this. There was one version that saw people dip their hands in boiling water or oil, which right there, uh, you ever seen those like women's commercials where they dip the nah, anyway. Walking across hot coals, which can be proven to be done without getting hurt. I saw it on Mythbusters once, so if it's on Mythbusters, that's just truth, folks. Come on. Lastly, the one thing that I think is the worst is holding a hot stone or iron for a determined period of time. Yes, how long do you think you can hold onto a red hot iron? I say not long. Even with seconds of exposure, you would have close to third degree burns, probably third degree burns on the palm of your hands, and long before polysporin, painkillers, and toilet paper. Not a good combo. That you uh, don't you have a burnt hand? You go to do that, you know? Ooh, that's not gonna be good. That's you're gonna get a little sick. Number one, this is the worst one on the list: the Blood Eagle. The Vikings were very creative, to say the least. I, I just had to include this one, it's awful. And in the style of Mortal Kombat, of course, you take a crook, and you take his back, and, and you rip his rib cage out of his back. It was cut out from the chest and positioned in such a way that it looked like an eagle with its wings flying, just, you know, with a lot of blood, hence the blood eagle. After that amount of carnage, you would bleed out and experience excruciating pain. Not as common as other things on this list, it was safe for the worst of the worst, but. Yeah, it is the worst. No thank you. Coming in at number 10, Corey Delaney. I thought I'd start this list off nice and easy and more on the cheaper side of things. This one is fun. We all remember this movie. Project X, the comedy from 2012 about a young man who decides to throw the biggest, raddest kegger ever at his parents' house and ends up getting in a ton of trouble. Yeah, fun fact, also the most illegally torrented movie of 2012. I don't know, just a fun fact for you. And yes, based on a very true story. Delaney, now Worthington, of Melbourne, Australia, decided in 2008 that he would throw a small yet quaint shindig with a couple of his buddies. A couple chips, a couple dips. Actually, it was more like, quote, parents away, tell your mates. You don't want to miss this, it's going to be huge. Written on MSN, publicly. Well, this online invite turned into about 600 raging teenagers showing up to one house. If you've seen the movie, that's pretty well it. Basically looked like the purge, but like four locos on the lawn everywhere. Crashed and broken cars, broken into homes. The street, an absolute nightmare. But a school legend. Small fine though for mom and dad, only about 20,000 in damages. Not a bad fine. More of a fun little slap on the wrist if you ask me. Hey, drywall holes and a new roof are gonna cost ya. If we threw a rager back in high school, what do you think mom and dad would do? Like they'd publicly skin us like a medieval cat. I would never see my phone again. I'd be grounded for life. <laughs> Number nine, Tiger Woods. Yeah, before we head down to the oil spills and cover ups and all that jazz, we gotta have some fun, right? 14 time champion Tiger Woods. He's been in many spotlights over the many years, but we'll keep this in this lane for now, you know? Lane. He's good. Back in 2011, after the Masters, a viewer from Texas wrote to the FCC to complain that one Tiger Woods had been cursing and using a profane four letter word on live television. How dare he, I wonder why. Then later on during the second round coverage, another viewer wrote in and they say, on Good Friday, while my husband was watching the Masters golf tournament, all of a sudden the living room was now filled with a person swearing, using the Lord's name in vain and damning during golf. How unacceptable is that? When watching a sports program, we should be free from vile, insulting assaults like this one issued by Tiger Woods when he was unhappy with his golf drive. Yeah, good thing this household doesn't watch rugby. I don't know, imagine that. Yeah, I can't imagine what's frustrating about messing up a 400 yard drive in front of hundreds of thousands of people. Yeah, what compels a person to swear in a moment like that? Oh, I wonder, can't imagine. Every time my finger touches a hot pan, it just comes out, you can't help it. I swear at mini golfing. I'll be in a mini golfing thing 14 feet away from a birthday party. They're hiding behind like a glow in the dark whale and I'm like, <sighs> okay. Number eight, JP Morgan Chase. We've heard about this name in every movie that involves a suit. Guys in a suit, JP Morgan is a line somewhere in that movie. Basically this company in 1877 started as a bank and then funded some construction stuff and then bought some more banks, then paid for some public stuff. Hey, Brooklyn's Bridge, nice. 
and some more online banking stuff till we finally know it as one of the largest financial industries on earth. JP Morgan Chase literally has a hand in everything in everyone's pocket. Uh, where do I tap? It just right here. And that's done? Wow. And in 2021 was slapped with a huge fine for over 300 years worth of info publicly being traded and leaked. Uh oh. Two separate banking regulators have charged JP Morgan Chase over 200 million for leaking crucial security data on their work communication platform, WhatsApp. Yeah, WhatsApp. You know the worldwide conversation maker? All you need is a number and an area code. Well, apparently employees have been using this platform as their main source of communication since early 2015, and it seems that it breaches a couple of their security protocols. I get random people asking me all the time if this is Bridget or Trisha. Imagine 300 years worth of secure data, trillions of dollars at stake, and they're asking Tom where he's getting lunch today. Couldn't you just email each other at the office? You know someone was just sitting there for hours on end scrolling through 1777 documents in WhatsApp trying to find out where there's buried treasure. Keywords. Keywords. Number seven, Rory McIlroy. Okay, I had to include another golf one because it's so funny to me. It's funny to me that the sport that requires the most patience and stillness around every player, there's literally a guy that walks around with a shush board, like it's a live sitcom from the 90s. It's respected, even the way you clap during golf, that's not a hockey clap, it's a classy clap. It's a golf clap, you know? It has like a little, that's like a little weird thing to it. So when people like Rory McIlroy toss a club after said peaceful sport moment, it's jarring, right? It's gonna shock you. The USGA takes professionalism very seriously and back in 2015, in the second round of the World Championships, on the eighth hole, Rory McIlroy hits his ball right into the water on a par five, and in a fit of rage, he tosses his club into the pond as well, which is wild. Moments earlier, both the ball and the club were on land. Now they're both sunk in treasure. All because of this man, Rory. This isn't golf-like, this isn't professional. God knows he probably swore too. So in turn, Rory was fined $25,000. And after a quick apology, that fine dropped down to $5,000. Yeah, all because you said sorry. Number six, Volkswagen. Next up, emissions, Das Auto. Volkswagen has been issued a couple fines in the last 15 years. Hey, great cars, but a couple of issues here. Apparently Volkswagen has been under investigation by the automotive industry and the European Commission since around 2009 for violating harmful emissions qualifications and even selling defective cars to other countries in which Canada charged Volkswagen about 200 million in a lawsuit over unsafe manufacturing, 450 million in a cartel dispute surrounding the unsafe regulation of outdated nitrogen oxide technology named as the main player in the Dieselgate scandal. The Dieselgate scandal, like the Watergate scandal. I don't get the reference, I'm way too young. Basically they got caught using cheap and faulty software that doesn't meet safety to use emission standards and had to fess up. Lying, cheating, and covering it up, huh? Just driving and coughing nonstop, 13 puffers and car payments for a Mini Cooper, who'd have thought? Perfect. To date, Volkswagen has been issued around one billion in legal fines. Yikes. Number five, Google. The search engine that got me through school, jobs, adulthood, everything really, you name it. First of all, I remember when Google was new or newer, like I would sit for hours as a kid and just Google photos of boats or buildings, just things that exist in the world because I could, it was fun. Things on the internet, that was exciting enough, but apparently not for Google. The tech giant was hit with a $4.3 billion fine by EU regulators for breaking antitrust laws. Yeah, antitrust, the same company that autofills all your shit every time you try and sign in. Remember that one. Also hit thumbs up or else. Number four. Siemens, a household name. Not even sure how to say it correctly. We know this company, industry, healthcare, and energy. It's one of those companies that puts money into a ton of stuff like cyber this and cyber that. It's most known for tech stuff, software, and billion dollar bribes. That's right. German engineering giant Siemens AG has been fined 800 million by US authorities and an additional 395 million by German authorities. The company recently pleaded guilty to the corruption charges bribing foreign officials that violates a law called the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act. Between 2002 and 2017, the companies acted as a cartel to illegally share out contracts valued at around $4 billion. The company is alleged to have bribed officials approximately 4,000 times between 2000 and 2006, with the goal of winning contracts abroad as an alpha supplier. Okay, so a little mob stuff, huh? I like it. A little suitcase full of money kind of thing. And that's exactly what happened. Hidden bank accounts, obscure intermediaries, and pseudo consultants. 
that's a mouthful. FBI caught on, of course, in 2008, but it wasn't until 2021 that the investigation unfolded and fines were issued. In total, about 1.6 billion for foreign bribery charges. Wow, that's a lot of money. Number three, Bank of America. Following the financial crisis of 2008, banks were held under a new light. This was a black light, right? Ready to see all the yuck going on behind that dirty counter. What's what's going on over there? What is that? Show me that. Any sketchy detailings will now be abundantly clear. Let's avoid further financial situation. We can't be putting out subprime loans to sketchy clients anymore. We need people who are gonna pay us back. Kinda helps. Then cut to 2013, the company was caught for selling toxic mortgages to investors. Yeah, that's a no-no. They were a big part of the financial crisis, so this time the Bank of America got a fine. This time, they got fined $16.65 billion. That's like two games of Monopoly put together, all the cash if you add them up. That's a lot of cash. Number two, TEPCO, Tokyo Electric Power Company. Okay, so now we're talking big money. Big whoopsie daisies. Four former TEPCO executives have been ordered by court to pay 80 billion over the 2011 Fukushima nuclear power plant disaster. In March 2011, a large undersea earthquake off the coast of Japan triggered a massive tsunami. When the huge waves flooded the generators, the cooling systems failed, causing the reactors to melt. The Fukushima meltdown was considered the worst nuclear disaster since Chernobyl in 1986 and prompted the declaration of a 30 kilometer evacuation zone around the Japanese plant. TEPCO is currently engaged in a decades-long effort to decommission the plant, which will take years to clear. The devastation alone caused the deaths of 18,000 people and wiped out entire towns off the map. Yeah, that's gonna cost you. Also, how are these four dudes gonna come up with 80 billion? It's like 20 billion each. Hey, if you're gonna ignore the massive tsunami warnings from scientists, you're gonna have to clean it up, dude. Also, a huge nuclear power plant close to an underwater volcano? Explain that one to me. And finally, number one, Pfizer. When we think of the name Pfizer, there's now obviously mixed feelings, pun intended. But back in 2009, before they were making cures, they were paying hefty fines. The world's largest pharmaceutical company had to pay a record-breaking fine. They had to pay $2.3 billion in criminal and civil penalties over unlawful prescription drug promotions. Yeah, you can't, you can't be doing that stuff. Included in this mighty slap on the wrist was a $1.2 billion criminal fine. And the agreement was also a criminal forfeiture of $105 million. This was the fourth time Pfizer got charged with this magnitude in a decade. They were on a bad streak, dare I say. They promoted their products at resorts. They would invite doctors in to these meetings and then give them golf or massages. They would pepper you up, right? So you were then Team Pfizer, right? You were, you were on board. FBI Assistant Director Kevin Perkins says the corporate giant was blatantly violating the law and misleading the public through false marketing claims i.e. golf. See, it's always golf. That's why they're swearing. They're making, they're making cures over there for that left swing. Number 10, man eats underwear to avoid breathalyzer. In Alberta, Canada, there was a man in 1985 by the name of David Zerfle. He was pulled over by RCMP officer for weaving on a snowy road after apparently drinking one night. He then decided to run from police after being pulled over on foot. It's literally every cop's dream. They're sitting there, please run, please run, yes! Of course they caught him and booked him for what intended on being an impaired driving charge. Whilst in the back of the cruiser, of course, David ripped the crotch out of his underwear to eat it. A uh, couple things here. How do you even get that down? I can't swallow a Tylenol without choking. Apparently he didn't eat it, eat it. He spat it out after a while and was just kind of chewing on it. His theory was that the cotton might absorb the alcohol content before he got to the station to do a proper test. Which, when he got there, he was acquitted of all charges and blew a legal, respectful .8. He did it. I mean, first off, dick move for driving though. That's not cool. Very dangerous and very selfish. Best part comes weeks later at his hearing. Just so happened a group of grade 11 and 12 law students watching the hearing as a class. Just, you know, teenagers giggling the entire time. Of course they were, they were teenagers. Order, order! Did you stuff your own tidy whities into your mouth? Objection, your honor, leading the witness. Number nine, spider hostage. Look, I don't, I don't like spiders. This next guy on our list doesn't even respect spiders, okay? Paul Brian Smith, the man who has three first names. Back in 2012, Paul agreed to watch a friend's pet spider, which on paper at first I'm like, hey, gross, but I get it, that's awesome. A Little bit of Home Alone vibes going on there. When the friend came to collect said furry friend, Paul held the spider ransom. Said if he didn't get $100, he'd swat the spider. <laughs> he'd swat the spider. Sounds like a, like a Spider-Man villain there. Like J. Jonah Jameson, gonna swat the spider. 
In turn, Paul received 40 months in prison for burglary, theft, possession of drug paraphernalia, and more. Yeah, there may or may not have also been a person hiding in the closet when cops came around. This one's really bizarre. Can't really talk about the weird, awful extra details on this case. Paul Brian Smith, give it a looky once you're done here. Also, save the spiders, they're good. Number eight, a bath salts Christmas. An Ohio Christmas miracle. Sounds like a Christian rock group. A man by the name of Terry Trent was charged with breaking and entering a home at Christmas when he was arrested very high on little more than just Christmas spirit. The family arrived home and saw the man sitting on their couch watching some Christmas shows. While dad's on the phone with police, the man apologized, thanked them for his stay, and calmly left. Family said that the man apologized after lighting a candle, fixing up their wreath, relaxing on the couch, and finishing up the last Christmas tree decorations. Ah, the spirit of Christmas. The guy's the opposite to the Grinch. Dude, this guy's the real Santa Claus. I hope you're all good. He's coming in to do his check-ins. Police arrived and said Terry didn't cause any problems, went in with them calmly and quietly. See, guy just needed some Christmas company. Wanted to catch Mr. Bean's Christmas special. Who wouldn't? That could have been really, really bad and turned out to be a zombie apocalypse Christmas dinner, but thankfully it did not. Also, it's Christmas. I've seen my hands after some wine. It's pretty well the same thing, isn't it? Number seven. Photo bomb. I love a good photo bomb. I dug this one out of the archives. This is from six years ago at a bar. I'm a big fan of ruining a beautiful moment between two other friends. Friends? These are my friends. Sometimes photos catch great moments. Sometimes they catch not so smooth criminals as well. Back in October 2010, a Wisconsin man got caught trying to steal a tourist bag. This guy was caught in 4K. While he was stealing the bag, the owners of said bag were taking a selfie a few meters away. He's in the background taking the bag, just clear as day. It's so funny. He immediately was sentenced to five days in jail, obviously. The 69-year-old man's name is Glenn Lambright. Pretty ironic last name, seeing how easily he was caught. Mr. Lambright was also fined $500. Guy just gets caught in a boomerang. Number six, dances with lions. 32-year-old Maya Autry of Bronx, New York was caught on camera at the Bronx Zoo apparently taunting and dancing in the lion's exhibit with a lion. She apparently calls herself the Lion Queen and she has been seen on camera not once but twice dangerously close to these cats inside the lion's exhibit. She's lucky that this thing is tranked out of its mind, just chilling, bored. People will do anything nowadays for the gram. She's throw some cash, threw a dozen red roses and dance for the lion. You know, dinner and a show. The lion has been praying for a day where someone gets this bold. Apparently she gotten herself into the exhibit before and was handed a citation prior and a year ban before returning again. Two counts of criminal trespassing. The video's great too, the lion's just sitting there. He's like, so uh, you coming in or not? You just gonna stand there? Hey, you know the uh, score of the Knicks game? No, all right. Number five, banana theft. Thief, banana thief. Theft, I don't know. Turns out bananas curse people, makes them do crazy things. This, uh, this next couple is pretty odd, here we go. Back in 2014, a Connecticut burglar drove his station wagon through the doors of a closed convenience store. He drove literally into a gas station, got out, stole a single banana, they peeled and then ate the fruit and then fled the scene. That's right, nothing else was taken, no cash. I mean, there's obviously significant damage that has to be taken care of now, but the banana, the lone single banana, why? This isn't Mario Kart. You can't just throw a peel down and then make a getaway. You're gonna get caught. It's 2022, my guy. Keep your bananas safe, folks. These people are sick. For example, number four, fruit fight. Florida resident Philip Joseph Smolsky was charged with assault and battery on his girlfriend for apparently using a banana to throw at her. Police were called on the morning of January 3rd, 2014, and Pasco County deputy noticed a red mark on the victim's head where she said she had been hit by a flying fruit. That's like the start of a cops episode, you know? Just driving. Uh, 42, David, we're uh, actually responding now to a banana and pajamas over on uh, After David uh, Avenue. The arrest affidavit shows that the same deputy also found a banana in a nearby garbage can and that parts of the peel were found on the ground near where the girlfriend was sitting. Hmm, a clue. In addition to the domestic battery charges, he was also charged with attempting to resist arrest without violence. How do you resist arrest without violence? Just say no, like no thank you, politely a couple times? No, I'm okay, thank you. Police say that pepper spray then was used to apprehend Smolsky. Ouch. This is just like the origins of a villain story. Oh no, it's Mr. Potassium Man. He's like throwing banana peels. Ah, don't slip. Whip. Number three, tattoos tell all. Sometimes you get a tattoo to remember a person or a place or a time. Sometimes you get a tattoo of a mountain. 
on your forearm because you like nature and being outside and that one trip that one time. Great, we get it, we love it. Every tattoo is meaningful in some way, sure. Well, thanks to those fond memories being drawn in ink, it was quite easy for California police to find the killer of a victim who had died four years prior. This killer, Anthony Garcia, decided to remember this horrible act after doing it by getting a tattoo of all the grim details right there on his chest. Yeah, police noticed the chest tats when taking Garcia's mugshot for another crime, much smaller than, you know, murder, and that's where the tattoo stuck out to the police. They're like, wait a minute, we've been here before. The Christmas lights, the bent street lamp near the liquor store, this was the exact scene where the body was found four years prior. There was even a helicopter that looked angry depicting Garcia's nickname, Chopper. Yeah, I have, I have a dragonfly for my mom. I don't like needles, it's probably the only one. Number two, reverse Santa. Ah, the old reverse Santa, huh? The old chimney sweep. Apparently this is way more common than I thought. A Maryland man who was asked to remain anonymous, due to the ongoing case of course, is facing charges in court recently as the police had to respond to two calls from the same house. The family apparently heard scuffling and coughing in the middle of the night from behind their fireplace wall and decided to reach out to authorities. But they were already beat to the chase by the man stuck in their wall. Yeah, I'd stay anonymous too. That's embarrassing. Guys just whispering directions to your house. Uh, yeah, it's uh, Bradshaw. <laughs> uh, Brad Bradshaw? Bravo? Romeo? Guy had to rat on himself. The fire department showed up, had to rip the wall down brick by brick to get Buddy out. Like you wasted everyone's time, man. The family's time, the first responder's time, your getaway driver's time. And these guys' mug shots, they're the best. They're always just covered in soot, like a bad Oliver production. I'd do anything. And finally, number one, use current location. Gotta save the most bizarre for last, I guess. Kristen DaCosta from Massachusetts. She's clearly never seen the movie Disturbia. She's sleeping on it. She's sleeping on Shia LaBeouf. Kristen was court ordered to wear an ankle bracelet as part of her probation, but she luckily didn't know that the bracelet could track your whereabouts. Yeah, what did she think it was doing this whole time? She's like, okay, thanks. That's random. And then just committed crimes. This is why you have to watch Disturbia. Stop sleeping on Shia. Kristen had no clue that it was tracking her while she committed 17 break-ins. Yeah, homes all over Southern Massachusetts, Rhode Island, New Bedford, Fairhaven. I mean, where does she get the energy, you know? <laughs> where does she find all that energy? So random. She didn't destroy anything at all. She just stole jewelry and then left. The police just watched her go spot to spot, tracking her down, just ping, 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 awesome. There she is, there she is now, great. One owner didn't even realize they'd been robbed. That's how fast Kristen was, so, you know. If only she didn't have that ankle monitor on the entire time, she would have maybe got away with one of the 17 that she tried. I can't hop one fence, let alone 17. That's insane. I'm kind of impressed. Don't do crimes, but that's, that's a little impressive. Number 10. Queen of hating her daughter. Starting off this list with a bang would have to be the utterly despicable Maria Eleonora of Brandenburg, the Queen of Sweden. Queen Maria here seems to be guilty of the crime of attempted delifing. That's a pretty crazy thing for a queen, but it gets even crazier when you find out it was her own daughter who she tried to do this to. For some reason, when the queen gave birth to her daughter, who she wanted to be a son, she instantly thought of her sweet, innocent little daughter as a dark and ugly monster with black eyes. Gotta love coming into this world and being hated purely for existing. As she saw her as a monster, Maria tried to have her daughter dispatched multiple times and I don't know what this crime would be called, but she even forced her daughter to sleep next to the rotting corpse of her own father. Maybe that's the true crime here, because this is messed up. Number nine, don't mess with the empress. The only powerful female emperor in the history of China has got to make you extremely ruthless, simply because you are a target and you would have needed to work to get to where you are. And you know what? Wu Zetian, who ruled during China's Tang Dynasty, was quite ruthless. She took her position of power by force, and she slayed many people in order to do so. But she didn't stop there. She committed more acts of slaying throughout her rule as well. And I don't mean like slay queen, although that does really work for this list, but no, she slayed people. And we don't support that kind of criminal behavior, even if you are above the law. To make matters worse though, it is reported that even her mother and grandchildren fell onto that list of victims, all because they were against her. Truly a ruthless queen. Number eight, mommy issues. 
Empress Irene of Athens ruled between 797 to 802, and she co-ruled with her son for two decades before leaving it all by herself. That's not a crime. But how she did so was a bit more, I don't know, just a little outside the realm of legality by today's standards. Her son, Emperor Constantine VI, was not a popular emperor, and the empress was quite an ambitious and greedy woman. She wanted full control of the Byzantine Empire, and to do that, with the help of some political allies, Irene led a conspiracy against her own son. Poor parenting skills if you ask me, but hey, the two actually made up and were at least somewhat civil. That is until Constantine divorced his wife and married his mistress, turning the people against him and giving Irene the opportunity to lead another conspiracy and then have her son's eyes gouged out. Yay! Number 7. Rana Valona I honestly didn't know Madagascar had queens or kings. That's not because it doesn't make sense, I, I'm, just, I'm just dumb. Thanks to me being a young child, I thought the only royalty Madagascar had was King Julian. You know, like the lemur? King Julian! Like that, that King Julian? Um, but they did have kings and queens, and one of these queens was pretty damn brutal. Queen Rene Valona I ruled Madagascar between 1828 and 1861, and there is absolutely no doubt that she would do anything for her kingdom. After King Radama I, her husband, passed away, she took over the crown, and during her reign, she put a lot of people to the axe, or whatever way they executed people in Madagascar. Her uncle was one who met the sticky end to protect her power. But some records state that Rena Valona ended her own mother's life by subjecting her to starvation. Rena Valona sent her mom to her room and didn't let her have dinner. Or any meals, really. That's never okay. And would get someone like us charged under the law with something. I don't know what exactly it would be, but it'd be something. Number six, pretty firmly against cheating. Not to be weird, but I can kind of see where this queen is coming from at first. At first, I sort of get it, but not later on, just at first. Henry II of France had a lifelong affair with his mistress, Diane de Poitiers. And even while on his deathbed, he begged his own wife, Queen Catherine de Medici, to allow him to see her. Kind of really disrespectful to your wife, but I guess he loved his mistress too. I, mm -mm. I'm kind of confused on the morals of this. However, the queen was not confused on the morals and didn't give in to his plea. In fact, she even denied Diane entry into the room, letting the king pass away without having his dying wish granted. Damn. That ain't a crime. This queen had a daughter who took after her dear old dad when it came to the whole monogamous relationships, meaning she didn't really have them. When the queen mother found out about her married daughter's new romantic interest, she locked her daughter up in a castle and never saw her again. But she became even worse when she ordered her daughter's romantic interest to be executed in front of her. Now that is rough. And while she didn't do the deed herself, giving the order is kind of bad enough. It gets worse. Her son, King Henry, didn't like that she cruelly did this to her own daughter, so she had him dispatched as well. My goodness. Number 5. Bloody Mary Duh. Mary the First, or Bloody Mary as she is also known, was the first real Queen of Britain. But this reign didn't last very long, five years to be exact, before she was replaced by the much, much better Queen Elizabeth. But in that short five year span, Bloody Mary earned that title, let me tell you. Mary the First ordered war against the Protestants and slew quite a hardy handful of them for heresy. Which is interesting since her father, Henry VIII, was kind of the guy who made Protestants more of a thing in England and then her sister was also Protestant and made it the main religion in England. History is full of people needlessly passing away because what they believe isn't the right thing. Anyways, to heat things up, Mary even had some of these Protestants burned on the spot. Some is kind of an unfair statement. You see, the queen here was responsible for burning over 300 Protestants at the stake. Other kings and queens burned people at the stake for their faith. I mean, Mary's father did it, as did her sister. But it's the sheer amount of people that make her much worse and much more famous. Number four, taking over. Queen Catherine the Great of Russia was obviously a queen of Russia. But that don't mean she was actually Russian. She was actually German born. But she was Russian to get herself into power when it turns out her husband, Emperor Peter, was not very liked by his own people, as he showed a very obvious dislike for Russia, which is kind of weird. She took advantage of people's disdain, and while she may not have directly done the life ending here, it is pretty well stated that the act was committed by her supporters and public opinion held her responsible. 
She was called the Great, but it seems she was actually kind of the absolute worst, even if she was a strong ruler. She does look very proud of herself in a lot of her paintings though, which, I mean, she overthrew her own emperor husband and became ruler of a country she isn't even native to. So like, yeah, I guess, good job, I think. <laughs> Number three, La Loca the Loco. Finally, a queen not on this list for ending other people's lives. No, Juana La Loca was far worse than that. Not to be insensitive, but Juana La Loca was loco. She was the Queen of Castile from 1504 to 1516, and she suffered from various mental disorders. After her husband died in 1506, her father buried his body, but that didn't stop La Loca from opening the tomb and caressing her husband's non-living body from time to time. Ultimately, she even ordered people to dig up the body fully, and she would kiss her deceased husband's feet. I'm sorry, excuse me, I need, I need some water after that. That's disgusting. Mm, that's a lot. Mm -hmm. Oh good, we aren't done. Of course not. No, no, apparently, Juana would also carry his coffin everywhere with her, and even kept it under her bed. It wasn't until years and years later she allowed his burial outside her window, finally. Look, I, I get loving somebody, but dear lord, imagine what she was like when he was alive. Stage 10 clinger, 100%. Number two, let them eat cake. How about a queen that caused a whole revolution? That's gotta be a good one. We have almost all heard of Marie Antoinette. She was well known for splurging on things she shouldn't have and the countless affairs and scandals she was involved in. Like the scandal of the necklace. Countess de la Motte pretended to be the queen's friend and entered the French court in 1785. She fooled a member of high society in believing that the queen loved him, even going as far as to hire a lady of the night, disguise her as the queen, and convince the poor guy that Antoinette wanted to purchase a diamond necklace that cost 1,600,000 livres, which is almost $12 million by today's money. The amount of sheer greed and debauchery that happened while she was around made her own people rise up and fight back against the unfairness of the French monarchy. Good job, you made your people hate you, cause y'all ignorant. Number one, Countess not Dracula? Born in Transylvania, because of course she was, in 1560, Countess Elizabeth Bathory of Hungary was a Hungarian noblewoman. But more than that, she was an extremely infamous serial slayer. She used her position of power to defend herself from ever having to suffer the consequences of the heinous crimes she would commit. Okay, well, name the crimes, Adam. Okay, I will. Elizabeth spent years slaying servants and peasants just because she wanted to and enjoyed it. She did it so much that her own husband, Count Nadasti, went so far as to build his wife a torment chamber for her to do this more comfortably. Great husband, horrible person. Elizabeth also had a nasty habit of actually feasting on her prey. She would often bite and eat chunks out of them while they were still alive, and in one case, she may have even forced someone to cook and eat some of their own body. Eventually, her conduct became so appalling that a trial was held. It only took forever to happen. She was convicted on 80 counts, but was only sentenced to solitary imprisonment within her castle. That's it. Like, how is that okay? I don't get it. She thankfully met her end three years later in 1614, but my lord, was she a bad dudette. Not good. Number 10, grave robbing. Probably the most infamous crime of the time and today, really. The ancient Egyptians were many things and that included vain. There's a reason why they got Elizabeth Taylor to play Cleopatra, it all makes sense. The pharaohs of Egypt were buried with immeasurable amounts of treasures, gold, gems, jewels, swords, cats, dogs, just about everything but the kitchen sink. Once the tombs were sealed, the treasure was also sealed in there forever, or so they thought. That was until some crafty thieves broke into the tombs and slipped away with the loot. When a lot of Egypt was being discovered in the 1920s, it was unsure if the loot had been taken 10 years ago or 1,000 years ago. There's not really a way to know. And yes, it still happens to this day, and yes, it's awful. Leave it in there, it belongs to them, please. No more, no, no loot, Tim, don't go loot, Tim, please. Number 9. Bribery Given that Egypt was one of the greatest civilizations the ancient world ever saw, it makes sense that they had it all. Currency, law, order. However, sometimes well, sometimes these things just don't mix. Ever seen Better Call Saul? Yeah, exactly. They had a good system for the time and it was fairly concrete. However, like concrete over time, 
there's little tiny cracks that form, aka bribery. Oftentimes when facing serious charges against the pharaoh, there was an option to opt out of your sentence, just open your wallet and dish out some cash. This has worked in ancient Egypt, medieval Europe, 1920s America, and today. Say what you will, but the almighty dollar does have buying power. Number 8. Unaliving. If women of the evening partake in the world's oldest profession every night, then unaliving is the second thing we ever did. It's not really a profession, but it's we've been doing it for a long time. It's pretty sad, but it's true. Sure, it's always been frowned upon, but today we have a lot of rules, laws, and regulations regarding said rules, laws, and regulations about unaliving. It's bad. Don't do it. It was unfortunately more common than we think back in the day, especially amongst royals in ancient Egypt frothing at the mouth for the throne. But this is something that could have happened to anyone. Plus, in a time before CSI and guys throwing off their glasses to make very obvious low-hanging fruit jokes, well, if you didn't see the crime, then you probably wouldn't catch the crook. So people kind of just got away with it sometimes. Not all the time, but sometimes. Number 7. Assassination. Related to my last point, nothing is true, everything is permitted. The creed of the assassins in one of my favorite video game franchises, at least up until they did pirates. After that, it's... I was all kind of downhill after that. Well, despite the inaccuracies of the Assassin's Creed series has, like falling from great heights into bales of hay, the first known assassins just may have started in Rome and Egypt. More likely Egypt than spread to Rome, actually. Like a Sith, a lot of these early assassinations were for revenge, personal ambition, power lust, especially in the pursuit of success. Some were even part of larger plans. Now, it's one thing to be violent, sure, but to organize the destruction of a dynasty through the means of your knife? Well, it's amazing what a couple inches of steel can accomplish. Who goes there? Someone's knocking on the door? We're good. Okay, anyway, sorry. Number six, treason. Law and order in Egypt were associated with something called Mahat. I believe that's how you say it, which refers to truth and justice within society. Like I said before, great idea, great start, but more often than not, the ancient Egyptians had to fight off a lot of treason and corruption, uh, more than they like to admit it. Like when King Ramses III chose the heir to his throne, and uh, well, it wasn't who his wife had picked out, so there was going to be problems. There was a lot of wives, sons, and, and breeding, there's, con there's confusing lines. So in order to get what she wanted, she was going to stab him in the back. Literally. Well, her plot was unfoiled and her and all the conspirators were immediately unalived as punishment. There wasn't even a burial service as they were all thrown in the river afterwards. No amount of money or bribery could save them there. Number 5. Thigh or leg. Ever sit down at the holiday dinner table and your uncle's cutting the turkey and says, Are you a thigh man or are you a leg man? <laughs> Except he says the same thing every Christmas and you can't wait for him to say it because that means you're another second closer to not being there. Anxiety is a heck of a thing, man. I don't have anxiety that bad. I'm just trying to relate to some of the people out there. I feel like I've been there with you. I don't know. Well, this was no Christmas and this certainly was no turkey, but people were talking about here. Yeah, we're talking about people. When someone was found to have done a serious enough crime, but not serious enough to be unalived, the authorities met in the middle by taking a leg. Oh god, that's awful. Now some of you might be thinking, well, I guess it's not that bad. You, you lose a leg and you move on, but imagine being held down and someone hacking your leg off with a bronze tool because steel doesn't exist yet. Oh, it's awful, awful, no good, no painkillers. Number four, homework. Homework, 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 homework. Love it or hate it. Well, I actually hate it, and so did most of my friends. Some say it's needed in a modern world to teach efficiently. Some argue it doesn't do anything at all. I did my homework 90% of the time, believe it or not. And I know some, some of you are gonna comment and say, oh, Chetty, no you didn't. I did, I really did. But when I didn't, I would usually come in and charm my way out of it. Hi, Mrs. Middleton, you look great today. You're the best. It worked most of the time, what can I say? Usually on, the, usually on the female teachers, it didn't work on the male teachers so. though. But the worst that would have happened is that I would lose a percent off my grade here or there, but I just make it up back on the test, no problem. Well, scribes in ancient Egypt weren't so lucky. They were very important as they were literally the writers of the time. They, they described the history, it's pretty cool actually. However, if they chose to stay up all night and play Call of Duty like I did, well, their punishment was a more of the violent physical variety and not so much the stern talking to or I'm going to phone your mother variety. My mom didn't care. Number three, caning. 
Another trait of punishment for crimes was caning of the feet, which is actually arguably the worst thing on this list. Since, you know, we use feet every time we walk or do something, you're, you're gonna need spot treatment after this one. A very simple process, the person is strapped down, feet exposed, a governing official then takes as many lashes to the feet as required. Painful, humiliating, and possibly dangerous. Cuts could lead to infection as we're walking around in heat, sweat, and well, some folks, if you were poor enough, just didn't have shoes. The worst I ever got was a couple minutes on the timeout corner, except that my mom felt bad because I looked really cute and I was sad and everything was fine. No spanking required. I was a good boy, I promise. There's some people don't think I was a good boy, but I really was a good boy. Number two, barbecue. I feel like the moment humans discovered fire, well, that fire hurts, we wanted to throw everything in it and see what happens. Now, I jokingly call this segment barbecue, but that's because it's really horrible. Famously, a group of rebels in ancient Egypt were immolated after trying to overthrow the pharaoh. Where after the barbecue from hell had finished, the pharaoh used these rebels as human torches. I, that's, oh, wow, okay. All Fantastic Four jokes aside, it was horrible, smelly, and cruel. Don't ever do this, please. Number one, adultery. Surprisingly, one of the most punishable crimes in ancient Egypt was being unfaithful, partly related to the lifestyle of Mahat and being truthful and just. It really makes sense. Just be a good boy. It makes a lot of sense, but some people don't follow that. The whole thing is bizarre because, well, no one really followed it, especially the royals. I mean, they had kids with their sisters and brothers and cousins and, and others and all, uh, just, it's messy. However, some folks did find themselves caught in this law, and when they did, they could succumb to anything on this list. For women, it was most likely the torch. For men, it was impalement and then being tossed into the river because, you know. Better keep those love notes to yourself, folks. Not worth getting burned over. It's, it's not worth it. Just keep these yourself. Number 10, Boudica. She was very tall, the glance of her eye most fierce, her voice harsh. A great mass of the reddest hair fell down to her hips. Her appearance was terrifying. Sounds awesome to me. One of the most famous queens in British history, Queen Boudicca was originally co-ruler of the Iceni tribe of East Anglia, alongside her husband, King Prasitagus. That is, she was until the Roman governor of Britain at the time attacked. Prasitagus was killed and his lands and household were plundered by the Romans. Boudicca and her daughters were rather savagely treated as well. So much so that after the fact she rose up leading other tribes of Britons who banded together and decided to take the fight back to the Romans. The Britons captured the Roman settlement of modern day Colchester with the imperial agent fleeing to Gaul. They fought to London and to St. Albans, storming the cities and sending the defenders fleeing. The Britons desecrated the Roman cemeteries, mutilating statues and breaking tombstones. The Roman governor of Britain at the time, who had fled with his troops into the safety of the Roman military zone, challenged Boudicca with an army of 10,000 regulars and auxiliaries. Win the battle or perish, that is what I, a woman, will do. You men can live on in slavery if that's what you want. It's a pretty good quote. The battle was a brutal defeat though, with Boudicca taking poison to avoid becoming a prisoner. Criminal to the Romans, but I mean, a hero to pretty much everyone else. Number nine, Nefertiti. Kind of hard to call this a crime, but basically Nefertiti was the wife of the Egyptian pharaoh Amenhotep IV. Being close to equal in power to her husband, as well as very influential in her own right, she and her husband did something quite scandalous. They decided to turn their backs on almost the entire pantheon of Egyptian gods, sort of. They made one god the prime god of Egyptian religion during their reign. That would be the god of the sun, Aten. They moved the capital of Egypt to a new location, which they named after Aten, and they even both changed their names. He became Akhenaten, and she became, give me a sec here, um, Nefer Neferatau, nope, Nefer, <laughs> Nefer Neferaten, Nefertiti. There's like a hyphen in there, I don't know. Both of those names, as you may have noticed, have the name Aten in them. Nobody liked this change and it was quickly reverted after they were no longer in power. It sure was scandalous though. Number eight, Anne Boleyn. Honestly, for most of the wives of Henry VIII, it's a little hard to, well one, pick one, but also two, really know if any of the things they were accused of actually happened or if they were just easy excuses. But nonetheless, 
here we are, and since we haven't talked about any before, why not start with the second one, who was, was pretty much the catalyst for Henry VIII and England breaking away from the Roman Catholic Church and forming a whole new church resulting in the deaths of an eventual thousands of people. You see, divorce is strictly prohibited in the Roman Catholic Church, so when Henry met Anne, his wife Catherine, who had not produced him a son to carry his name, just kind of had to go, prompting the whole damn reformation. Was it worth it? No, because the marriage lasted three years before she was charged with infidelity and incest and lost her head. I kind of feel bad for anyone associated with King Henry VIII though. Number seven, Queen Dida. Queen Dida of Kashmir was quite an ambitious queen mother. Dida seized complete administrative control during her husband's reign, ultimately becoming queen regent for her son and grandsons. That ain't enough for Miss Dita here. Mere advisory for her? No sir, she despised being just an advisor, and well, she disposed of all three of her grandsons using medieval forms of witchcraft and torture. Yikes, how dare they make Gma their advisor. Queen Dita got what she wanted at least, as she then reigned as monarch for 23 years, being in some form of power for nearly the whole of Kashmir's 10th century. And while she may have been more than a little brutal, she was honestly one of the best and strongest rulers Kashmir has ever had. Number 6. Queen Nandi Queen Nandi of the Zulu Empire has a story that literally sounds like it's straight out of a movie. Before the Zulu Empire ever came to become a thing at all, Nandi was impregnated by a Zulu chief in the 1700s, giving birth to a son they named Shaka. But being the third wife of the chief, she and her son were often ridiculed and shamed by other chieftains. Despite all that, Nandi raised Shaka to be an extremely fierce warrior. Shaka grew up to become the Zulu chief in 1815, and Nandi became the queen mother alongside him, known in English as the Great She-Elephant. She, alongside her son, wreaked havoc on those who had mistreated her and Shaka. But since Shaka remained unmarried, it was Nandi who, funnily enough, remained the power behind the throne of the Zulu Empire throughout her lifetime. She is the reason the Empire ever existed in the first place, and if any of what she did was a crime, uh, I kinda get it. Number 5. Julia Agrippina, Nero Maker Yes, making Nero should be considered a crime. But honestly, Julia Agrippina of Rome did quite a bit more than just that, and I can see where Nero got it all from. You see, Agrippina wanted to be in power, and when her uncle, Emperor Claudius, separated from his wife due to a scandal, Agrippina saw an opportunity, no matter how messed up it seems to both us and the people of the time. Agrippina seduced her uncle, became his fourth wife, and by extension, became the empress. But it doesn't stop there. She manipulated her uncle husband into making her son Nero heir to the throne and set up a marriage between Nero and her daughter-in-law Octavia. It's even rumored that she poisoned the food that ended her husband's life, allowing Nero to rise to power, which really bit her in the butt when Nero had her assassinated. What is this crazy family? Good God. Number 4. Queen Theodora Queen Theodora was scandalous before she even became queen. She was involved in theater from a young age, and one of her most well-known character portrayals involved her stripping down to next to nothingness. But her acting career slowed right down when she met and married Justinian I, who was the heir to the throne of the Byzantine Empire. The two of them were as thick as thieves and ruled together, but that doesn't mean she didn't have a knack for dispatching of those who threatened her position. She was scandalous, but she did way more good than she did bad. She set up houses for ladies of the night, worked for women's marriage and dowry rights, and banished brothel keepers from the Byzantine Empire. She was also a huge supporter of monophysitism. I hope I said that right. She's even considered a saint in the Eastern Orthodox Church of the modern day. Killing it, Theo. That's kind of a bad joke, actually. Number three, the great she-wolf of France. Queen Isabella of France started off her queen life married to Edward II of England, who preferred the company of men to his own wife. This is obviously a precarious and possibly extremely frustrating situation to find oneself in, but she kept it bottled up and even gave birth to a son, Edward III, until it all came to a head when her husband found a new favorite, 
She visited France and had an affair with Lord Roger Mortimer, an exile from England. But the better twist came when Isabella, alongside Mortimer and a mercenary army, invaded England, took the throne, and she became queen regent for her son Edward III until he came into power. She also was probably responsible for the dispatching of her husband Edward II while he was captured. Eventually her son would come into power and she was in prison for two years before being allowed to live a quieter life in retirement. Number two, Queen Fredegund. I was constantly double taking almost the entire time I was reading about this woman. She was crazy ruthless and all seemingly for the betterment of both her bloodline and the Merovingian kingdom. She became queen in the 5th century, marrying King Chilperic. And organizing the death of Queen Galswintha and sending Queen Odovera to a convent. When Brunhild, a big enemy for the king and sister of the late queen, swore vengeance on them, Fredegund brutally destroyed Brunhild's husband and sisters, destroying them as in that kind of thing. The queen also made sure that all of the other heirs to the throne stopped breathing making it a sure thing that her bloodline would occupy the Merovingian throne. Her son, Clotar II, was only a baby when the king met his end in 587. So, of course, this ambitious queen rose up to power, fighting battles, quelling rebellions, and ensuring the smooth running of the Merovingian kingdom in her role as queen regent. She met her end in 597, 10 years after her husband, but Clotar II continued in his mom's footsteps, having Brunhild and all her descendants removed from existence, resulting in 20 years of peace. So it's good. Number one, Cleopatra. A list of scandalous queens would not be complete without one of the most well known and famous rulers in history. Cleopatra VII, Philopater, was the last pharaoh Egypt ever had, reigning from 51 to 30 BC. Her life was full of scandal. When she first came into power, she was co-ruler with her husband and brother, Ptolemy XIII. But that didn't last very long as the two did not see eye to eye and it started a huge civil war in the country. At the same time, a conflict from Rome made its way to Egypt as well, resulting in Julius Caesar allegedly being seduced by Cleopatra and helping her end her brother's life. And again, being co-ruler with another of her brothers, also named Ptolemy, and ending the life of one of her sisters. She was also having an affair with Caesar and even produced a son with him, who became co-ruler with her after Caesar's death and after her other brother was seemingly assassinated. <sighs> I'm so glad I was not a part of these families. Just death and betrayal everywhere. She then went on to seduce second Roman triumvirate member Mark Anthony and sided with him when Octavian and Mark Anthony engaged in the final war of the Roman Republic, which Anthony lost, fighting with and alongside him until she poisoned herself to avoid being paraded through Rome and executed by the victorious Octavian. 